started this morning, and we're going to stand and sing number 191. 191, in my heart there rings a melody. Let's stand as we sing. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, melody of love. T'will be my endless theme in glory, with the angels I will sing. T'will be the glorious, glorious harmony, when the chords of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven in my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Well, good morning. Well, I hope there's a melody ringing in your heart. Well, I'll tell you, I had, to, I had to watch Matt there. Good thing he taught us about music theory in Sunday school, because I was like, and this 4-4 stuff is serious, I better... I better pay attention when we get to the chorus, but you know, it's good that we can sing and that we can worship the amazing, wonderful Savior that is Jesus Christ. It's so great that we can hear from his word and sing praises to his name and just rejoice together as a body. Well, let's invite him into our services and ask him to bless as only he can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, your grace is so powerful. Your majesty is so beautiful. We're so grateful, Lord, that we are able to know you and to have salvation through the blood of your Son. And Lord, we're so grateful that you've put a new song within our hearts and that you've established our goings and that you have been all in all to us what we've needed you to be. So Lord, as we're in your house today and we acknowledge your presence here by faith, we ask you to continue your faithful work. And we know you will, Lord. Minister to our hearts May we be open and responsive and sensitive to what you're doing. And Lord, above all things, receive our praise, for you are worthy to be praised for your greatness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, when we all get to heaven, it's going to be a great day. Amen. Well, let's sing about it. Page 56, brother, you come and lead us. Page 56, when we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing. Him in glory will the toils of life repay. 
when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us soon if beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall trim the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing shout the victory. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Some of us don't want to wait till we see Jesus to shout amen. Why wait? Yeah, that's right. Hungry? Why wait? You shall be filled. All right. Well, our call to worship comes from Psalm 99 today. Psalm 99. Of course, you're welcome to turn there as I read aloud. <coughs> Psalm 99, and I will uh, preempt our our thinking a little bit here, and I want you to think about as we read this text and as we enter into worship, think about the name of God, the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, the amazing power that is in his name, and I've been so intrigued as I've studied the Psalms in preparation for our Wednesday night Bible studies, uh, just how many times the Psalms have been used as a springboard for New Testament preaching and teaching. As we go through the book of Acts, we'll see that certainly more and more. But uh, don't just look at these as quote-unquote Old Testament scriptures. Uh, The beauty of the Lord's name comes through and through in in Psalm 99 And that doesn't matter what period of time you find yourself in. So Psalm 99 reads like this. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity, thou, equi- excuse me, thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name, they called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God. Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. The name of the Lord and his very holiness cannot be separated. He is who he is. And his name is an aspect of who he is. You know, I have four beautiful children, and I'm so thankful for that. And my wife and I, we named them. Who named God? Was it us through our language? Did we come up with names to identify God? No. He revealed his name to us. Even as we go throughout the passage of time and Moses was instructed to go to the children of Israel, he said, who, 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 who is sending me? Who should I say? And he says, you know, in days of old, they've known me by one name, but now they will know me as I am. Did Moses say, you know what? I think I'm going to call the person speaking to me from this burning bush the I am. Sounds good. Makes sense. I mean, No. No, God reveals his name, and it's a holy name. It's not a name we gave to him. It's a part of who he is. What happens with his name? It's a holy name. It's separate. It's distinct. It's pure. It's righteous. It's great, and it's terrible. And what happens when people call upon the name in faith and repentance? 
when they call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. You know, we can cry out generically in our English language and say, God, help me. Well, who is God? Generally, people affirm that they may believe in God or uh, accept some notion of a supreme being or a man upstairs, as I hear him euphemistically referred to as. But his name is holy. He is holy. And when we call upon his name, the name is, is a something that we can hold on to. It's a handle on his holiness. It's something tangible that reveals who he is. Jesus isn't just a, another name among, among the names that we have here. It means Savior. Christ is not just a, a, another name as though Martin is a last name. No, it, it means he is the anointed one. He is Messiah. He's the promised one. He is who he says he is, and he's holy. And when we think about just his name, even if we were to just uh, let all that we know about God, everything else, fade into the background and just think about his name, we would have enough to drive us to our knees and say, I will worship at his holy hill. I will worship at his footstool, and I will come and humble myself and call upon that name. I will exalt the Lord our God, he's worthy of our worship. So our call to worship starts with his name. We call upon his name, and guess what happens when we call upon the beautiful name of Jesus? Well, the text tells us he answers us. If you're here today looking to hear from God, he will answer you. If you want to know Jesus and you call out to him, he's not going to send your call to voicemail. When he pops up and he wants to talk to you, it won't say potential spam. <laughs> I go, no, I'm not taking that. It will say powerful savior. Hmm. <laughs> Hello? <gasps> Jesus. Yes. I've been waiting for you. Call upon his name. God has done great things in the past. He's doing great things in the midst. Let's worship him. Let's call upon him. And I guarantee you he will speak to you even now, even in this service. And before you go home, you can say, you know what? I heard from the Lord. And he answered me. And it's going to be beautiful. So let's worship and pray. Father, we thank you. We worship you and the beauty of holiness. And we thank you. Lord, your name is holy and reverend. It's great and it's terrible. And, Lord, we use it as a way to understand you. Lord, pull us deeper into an understanding of yourself. We need you, and we need to know the power of your name. And, Lord, we rest on this promise that those who call upon you will receive an answer. So answer us today, O oh Lord, as only you can, and move in our hearts Draw us by your spirit and direct us by your scriptures and be glorified for your worthy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's all stand and worship in song once again. Brother, come and lead. Number 63, what a day that will be. As we sing this song, think, think about the emotions, the sensations listed in here. As I was looking through this this morning, a lot of us have a glimpse of heaven and, and our idea of heaven is a place about like this just better right but think about the words of this text no heartaches no clouds no tears but peace forevermore no sorrow no burdens no sickness no pain no parting you realize that the emotions the sensations we fear, feel here on earth the vast majority of them Will, will not exist in heaven. They simply will not exist. It will be peace forevermore. Most of us get just little glimpses of peace here on earth. That is going to be heaven. Eternal peace. And most of what we understand and know about life is just going to go away. It's not just a better version of this. It's heaven. Think about that as we're seeing. There is coming a 
that day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Take a few moments to greet those around you. As you find your seats, let's sing that second stanza. There will be no sorrow there. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there. And forever I will be. Glorious day. Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be thank you you may be seated at this time, we have some special music uh, by Brother Sean. I'll be singing a song called Love Lifted Me. It's on page 173 of your hymn book if you wish to follow along. If you weren't here this morning for Pastor's sermon here, uh, I encourage you to, um, uh, to go back to Facebook and listen to his sermon from the 9 o'clock sermon. Um, I'm just going to read... The passage that was the primary text from this morning and it's amazing how I wasn't originally planning on singing today but the theme works uh, together perfectly Romans 8 verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I was sinking deep in sin Far from the peaceful shore Very deeply stained within Sinking to rise no more But the master of the sea Heard my despairing cry From the waters lifted me Now safe am I Love lifted me When nothing else could help Love lifted me out of my sin now safe in him love lifted me souls in danger look above jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved today love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me out of my sin now safe in him love lifted me all my heart to him i give ever to him i'll cling in his blessed presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song Faithful, serving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me out of my sin. Now safe in him, love lifted me. Love lifted me out of my sin. Now safe in him, love lifted me. Well, praise the Lord. All right, at this time, we'll go ahead and dismiss the kiddos for junior church. As the rest of us turn to the book of Acts, chapter number three. Well, we continue in our, uh, in our series here through the book of Acts and uh, how the church is on fire. And please, that is a metaphor, okay? Um, that is uh, the Holy Spirit's fire coming down and filling the church. And we've been looking at what a spirit church, uh, spirit-filled church is committed to. 
And here we're going to see how the spirit, what the Spirit-filled church imparts. And so we're going to read the first ten verses of Acts chapter 3 here. And we're going to see how, I think most importantly, how Spirit-filled church imparts what it does. So let's begin reading verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple and asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was, uh, that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And the name of my sermon this morning is the amazing name or excuse me, the amazing power of Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, truly, your name is amazing, and your power is beyond comprehension. But Lord, do help us to understand this text. And as we offer this time as uh, an opportunity for worship, I pray that we will yield ourselves to your spirit, that we will be attentive unto the text and its implications, and give us wisdom as we make application to our lives, that you may be glorified and we may honor your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The emphasis in Acts chapter 3 and 4 is on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we will see over and over again as we go through these chapters. And now a name, of course, implies much more than just identification. It carries with it authority. It carries reputation. And in some cases, it represents power. Now, when somebody says, you can use my name, hey, if you're going to see so-and-so, just tell them I sent you, right? I certainly hope that if we use that phrase, that that name actually means something. That if you say, hey, you know, Joe sent me down here. Oh, oh Joe sent you. Hmm, okay, great. <clears throat> or, oh, okay, sure, I'll take care of that. Now, if an order is given in the name of the President of the United States or the Prime Minister of Great Britain, those who receive the order know that they are obligated to obey it. Now, if I were to go down to the White House or 10 Downing Street, which is where the prime minister is, if I could even get in to either of those two places, right, nobody, and I mean nobody, would give much attention when Joe Martin comes and sits behind the Oval Office. I think I would be uh, not so nicely escorted out. Not all of us are so privy to get pictures and, and lauded with honor by the president. I'm just another taxpayer. My name has no official authority, none whatsoever. But the name of Jesus Christ has all authority, all authority, because he is the son of God. He said, all power is given unto me. Where? In heaven? Anywhere else? And in earth. <laughs> And the disciples are starting to come into a fuller realization of just how authoritative that name is. And mark it down. The great concern for these first Christians was the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and that his name would be glorified. And believers today should have that same concern that the name of Jesus Christ is glorified. Now, throughout these chapters, you'll see three stages, all right? Don't worry, we're not going through all three stages today. You're welcome. But I will say this, each stage reveals something wonderful about the name of Jesus Christ. 
Now, the first stage that we will examine today is in the text that we read, for, uh, chapters, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And the story is about Jesus' name healing a lame man. And guess what? The story begins like this in verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Now, as we approach the text, I want us to understand a few cultural practices that we need to keep in mind in order to appropriately come to an understanding of the text. The believers here are still attached to the temple. They were going to the temple, and they were still attached to the traditional hours of prayer. And you can read about this in Psalm 55, verse 17, Daniel chapter 6, Acts chapter 10, a little bit further. Um, but keep in mind, overall, the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts are describing a gradual transition from Israel to the Gentiles. Now, I'm coining a phrase here, from Jewish Christianity, okay, to one body Christianity that encompasses both Jews and Gentiles. It took several years. This is not a criticism. It's just the reality. It just took several years for the Jewish believers to really understand the place of the Gentiles in God's program. It just didn't make a lot of sense. In fact, they had councils and meetings and discussions and all sorts of stuff, right? And this understanding didn't come without its conflicts. Nevertheless, the events that we're describing here, especially in Acts chapter 3, are an explanation of the last verse of chapter 2, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 47. What does it say there? Well, let's just go back and read it. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you got to the end of that chapter and said, well, boy, how did that happen? Chapter 3. <laughs> That's where it all starts. This shows how the Lord added to his church daily. Now, what you see here, because remember, the church of Acts chapter 2 is filled with the Spirit. So what you have in Acts chapter 3 is the Spirit-filled church in action, right? And that church still remains a model for what Spirit-filled churches today will both do and be. Now, let's talk about two Spirit-filled believers mentioned here in our passage. Who are the two apostles that are mentioned? Peter and John. Now, they're often found together in Scripture in some interesting uh, situations, right? They were both uh, business partners. They were in the fishing business together, and they prepared the Passover together for Jesus, and they ran to the tomb on Easter Day, and they were the first one there. And I like that John wrote that he was the one that beat Peter. So, if, uh, you know, if they're taking their first century physical fitness test, right, John is standing at the finish line going, ha, I beat you. I beat you, I got you, I got you here at first, but, you know, he's still too humble to say his actual name, so it was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Why? Because he can run faster than Peter. But anyways, even later on, we'll see in Acts chapter 8 that these two guys are together again, ministering to the Samaritans that, that just believed on Jesus. So these two guys, they are close, they're joined, they're often seen together in ministry. But what's different now about Peter and John in the book of Acts that's different than the Peter and John in the Gospels? Well, now they're filled with the Spirit. The Spirit has come down, it's filled the believers, and they're no longer competing with each other. They're no longer saying, you know what, I should have the best spot next to Jesus. No, 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 I should. All right, let's just go talk to him. In fact, I'm going to go get, you know, John and James get their mom to come over and be like, hey, Jesus... My boys really want the best spots in the kingdom of heaven. You know, is there something you could do about that? Boy, you know, no. But now you have such a wonderful example of what unity looks like between two guys that used to be super competitive. And it reminds us of Psalm 133, verse 1, right? Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's, an, it's a great example of how the Holy Spirit unites us, us, all of us, to work cooperatively and not competitively. For us to work together and strive together, not for the sake of our own kingdom building, but for the sake of the gospel, as Paul commended in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Now, the story continues. Now we know a little bit of background on Peter and John. Let's see how the story continues to unfold. Verse 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, 
whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the, te- into the temple. So here, real quick, we, found, we find out that there's a beggar who's carried on a litter, right? And this guy has been crippled for life. From his mother's womb, he's always been a cripple. That means he's never, ever taken a step in his life. His whole life, he's had to be carried everywhere. And on this day, just like many, many other days, he's carried to the beautiful gate. And by the way, that gate is appropriately named. Of the nine gates that are all around the court of the Gentiles that lead into the temple itself, this one was by far the most spectacular. It was covered with opulent Corinthian bronze. And it was the light, when the light of the Easter morning hit this, it just shone. It looked like gold. In fact, even though it was bronze and other gates were silver plated or gold plated, this one was prized as the most valuable, right? All right, if the temple got knocked down and they decided to put this gate on eBay, it would go for the most amount of money, okay? Or Facebook Marketplace, all right? I'm sure they would cross post. Anyways, some of you are like, oh, I need to cross post that thing I'm trying to sell. Back on track, back on track. This thing was huge. If you've heard of the first century historian Josephus, he said this thing was 50 cubits high and 40 cubits wide, all right? We're not talking about the gate that goes to your backyard. This thing was massive, and it was so, so valuable. So I I say all that because I want you to understand the picture that if you're walking with Peter and John up to this temple, you see this opulent, beautiful gate, and right in front of, that's the backdrop for this beggar. This impotent, lame beggar. And there he is. You're surrounded by beauty, and then there's this guy. But for him, it is the perfect place to solicit funds, right? It's the most uh, advantageous. This guy is going to profit so much, and not to mention, the Jews thought that almsgiving was meritorious. It got him a little, got him a little insider favor with the Lord, you know what I'm saying? And so all of this is going as far as the beggar plans, but there's a higher sovereignty at place, right? This is a divine encounter. Something, uh, God is going to direct the attention of Peter and John to this man on purpose. Let's continue the story in verses 3 and 4. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Now, Peter and John probably had not even come to the gate just yet. This guy sees them, the beggar sees them just a little far off. He catches them in the sight, and and probably Peter and John are looking like good prospects, right? They're getting sized up by the beggar, and he goes, you know what? (laughs) They're Christians. They must be good tippers, right? So, you know, maybe, maybe I can get a little bit more money from them. And, you know, I'm sure as they get closer, there's this typical mechanical beggar's wail, right, where he's... Just repeated this millions and millions of times. Gentlemen, just, just a few cents, please. Just a few cents. And, and <clears throat> people typically just walk right on by. But Peter notices this lame man. And let me say this. I believe that the fact that he even noticed is evidence of the Spirit's ministry at work. It doesn't have to spell it out. These are Spirit-filled believers. And I say this that this is even spectacular that the Holy Spirit is is at work because we overlook people in general and we overlook beggars in particular. No doubt in this scene at the temple there will be thousands of people near the temple and perhaps even scores of beggars. But Peter and John fastened their eyes on this man. That means they looked purposefully and intently at him. But our modern culture is vastly different. We don't care to give handouts. We don't want to deal with panhandlers. There is no acceptable place for them to be because it always mars our activity and our perspective. I want you to picture this. Follow this story along with me. I want you to picture a married couple. They're heading out to dinner. It's going to be a beautiful night. Not just any dinner. I mean, fine dining. I mean, molto bene. I mean, it's going to be great Italian food. I mean, forget about it, right? It's going to be so good. And this couple, they're out for the evening, and they're in that bougie historic district, right? You know, where everything is just there ready for you to indulge in, and it's just going to be great. And boy, let me tell you, what is better than just relaxing, a nice evening out, and you get to just... 
just enjoy the luxuries and the little, a little bit of that fancy lifestyle, maybe even if just for an evening. Well, this couple, they park their car, they walk down the, the short scenic walk right by the river, and there they go, watching the golden sunset when a voice cracks through the air. Can you have any, any change, please? And you, and you notice this voice very slightly, but there's a slight lisp because the toothless beggar that's there interrupting your evening is trying to get a few a few pennies from you. He's lying on his only possessions. You notice very abruptly a, a foul stench, and you see just how filthy and foul this man really is, ba- having, having not bain, uh, bathed since, you know, really who knows when, right? And they don't say a word, this couple, not to one another, not to the man, because in our civilized world, beggars are not worthy. They're not worthy of our attention. But in the kingdom of God, spirit-filled believers see beyond appearances. They discern what is most important. What's most important? It's not your evening stroll to your fine dining. It's the gospel that this man needs. Here's a sound principle for all of us. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit when sharing the gospel. Only the Holy Spirit's filling will allow us to look beyond social class, racial differences, or any other barriers to our interactions. Now, this isn't to say that every beggar wants to know Jesus, nor is it to say that every encounter is an opportunity to go full Baptist on someone. I mean, full throttle evangelist. You know the type. But what I'm saying is more important than that. What I'm saying is be filled with the Spirit and the opportunities will become obvious regardless of social status, regardless of prejudices, and regardless of preferences. Now, Peter and John are following the leading of the Holy Spirit. They are attentive and they are responsive to the spirit and this encounter is providential it's a divine appointment peter responds to the beggar and he says basically look at us look on us now hit the pause button so you hit the pause button the little railroad tracks will be right there right we'll come back to this in just a second right here right here where peter says look at us this is a key moment of transition for Peter. I want you to understand why. Because in the grand scheme of things, things between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, Peter moves from being a preacher, preaching his greatest sermon, right? And he becomes a personal worker. Peter was reaching the multitudes, 3,000 peoples. He's got the bicep burn from baptizing so many people. But now he's ministering to just one poor man. Honestly, we need to hit the pause button on our lives right here as well. We have to examine ourselves given the context of chapters 2 and 3 because it's it's our time to remind ourselves that the way to reach the masses is not by preaching to the thousands. It's not by getting this pulpit to be louder. It's, It's not by having amazing programs. And you know I love me some programs, especially VBS. But it's by the way we reach the masses is one person at a time by helping one individual sinner. Now, spoiler alert, okay, so if you don't want to hear what happens in Acts chapter 4, you can, I'm giving you permission as the pastor to not listen to me for about 30 seconds, but after that, you gotta, you gotta turn it back on, okay? All right, I didn't say 30 minutes, I said 30 seconds, all right? The conversion of this one man will lead to the conversion of 5,000 people. Now, if that happens here, dude, we got to get a bigger everything, okay? We're already about to run out of Sunday school space. But this is the valuable insight that we have to learn. And this is what we've been trying to emphasize since the beginning of this year, the importance of just one person, the value of just one person. Remember that question we asked so many months ago, who's your one? Who is your one? 
that one person that you are prayerfully seeking to influence for Jesus Christ. And maybe you'll invite them to church. Maybe you'll invite them to your home. Maybe you'll share your testimony. Maybe you'll share a meal with them, right? Maybe you will have a conversation, and maybe you'll even have a chance to share the gospel. But who is that one that you're saying, you know what, this person needs to know the amazing power of the name of Jesus Christ? Because that's the name they call on when they believe unto salvation. When they believe that Jesus Christ was dead and buried and rose again the third day and they can believe uh, unto righteousness and they can make confession with their mouth and they'll call upon the name of the Lord and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord with that belief and understanding shall be saved. Who's your one? Who? You can offer a a, a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus Christ. You can preach the remissions of sins in his name like they did in Luke chapter 24 so that people might believe and have life through his name. No matter what you do, the question remains, who is your one? Now, for those of us who have been here, we're more than halfway through the year. And let, let, let me remind us that the miracle of conversion is just the miracle of a moment. But teaching and reaching someone with the gospel takes a lot of prayer and a lot of patience over the course of time. My family and I prayed for somebody to be saved. And for 18 years, did you hear that? In the time it takes to raise a child to adulthood, and then they can consider moving out. 18 years we prayed for someone to be saved. Now, that's an extreme example, but in my case, it was seven years from the time I first heard the gospel until the time I understood it at the age of 23. Listen, remember your one. Remember them. Pray for them. Mark their name down. Be burdened for them. You may be the only one who's burdened for them right now. And they may move and move on. And there needs to be somebody else there waiting for them by the sovereignty and providence of God to take the torch and carry that Holy Spirit flame and say, I will be the one that prays for this one. If there's anything we learn from Acts chapter 2 and 3, it's what we've already discovered uh, in our own insights that preaching to the masses, although it's necessary, it will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. It it won't suffice, nor will occasional prayer, nor, nor will training classes for Christian workers. Individual men and women are God's method. You and you and you and you and you times, however many of y'all are here, all right, we'll just say all y'all, because that's five or more, praise God. All y'all are God's method. I am God's method. There is no other method. I don't care if you use the Romans road or the Corinthian road or the Revelation road. I don't care what road you get on. Just all roads lead to Jesus. But there's no other means to get them there other than us. God's plan for the Great Commission and for discipleship is not something, it is someone. Now look, I'm going to tell you, exciting things are happening here week after week. I'm telling you, it's amazing. I'm thrilled, right? And I can tell you, it was probably very tempting for the Acts chapter 2 church, this early church, to just persevere in their own understanding and acquisition of apostolic doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and to linger in that Acts 2 experience, right? And to maybe cultivate this this mysterious club-like atmosphere and, and then maybe, maybe even unknowingly, they would just smother the fire of the Spirit with exclusiveness. We are not an exclusive bunch, We aren't. We are inclusive. That means whosoever will, let him come and drink freely. Is there anybody God doesn't want to save? Anybody? The Acts chapter 2 church didn't rest on their laurels. They didn't just just enjoy the experience and say, man, that was awesome. Cool. Um, Your house for dinner? All right, cool. All right, we'll do it again next week. Sounds good. They didn't do that. 
They remained under the reign of the Holy Spirit, and that reign created commitments, and then that commitment led to the expansion of, uh, of the gospel, and people would be saved, and they would experience Jesus Christ, and that's exactly what they wanted. And I'm hoping today that we are not content to just see awesome things happen Sunday after Sunday, but that every day we would, we would say, you know what, I'm not just content with great things happening here. But I want to be someone who is involved personally and directly with the mission of God. I want to be someone right here in my own world, in my own uh, uh, experience, to be someone who contributes to somebody getting saved. Contributing to something great doesn't start with the masses. It starts with one person. And I'm praying, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will begin to put in our hearts a desire, a longing, a passion, a burden for just one person. Just one person. Who's your one? If you don't have one, let me encourage you to get one. And you know what? We even have little bookmarks out there. You could put down their name, keep it privately, and there's scriptures in there that you could pray that will guide you to help you know how to pray for that one. That's what we want. Because listen, the call to follow Jesus and the call to make disciples are one and the same. They're one and the same. And discipling someone is easy. You know what it is? It's teaching somebody else how to follow Jesus like you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's all it is. Don't overthink it. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't overcomplicate it. Say, so why is this so important? People. Real people. Real souls are waiting at the end of our obedience to the Great Commission. Real people. Real people. At the end of Peter's attentive response to the Holy Spirit, the beggar was waiting to hear what Peter had to say. Let's read in verses 5 and 6. And he gave heed unto them, that's the beggar, he's listening, expecting to receive something of them. Are we about to receive something? Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise, rise up and walk. You know, this beggar, he's turning expectantly. He, he thinks Peter's going to give him something. And Peter says, in essence, I can't give you what I don't have. <laughs> I don't have any money. He had pulled his resources in Acts chapter 2 with the other believers. He doesn't have any silver. He doesn't have any gold. And maybe the beggar, you know, he starts to frown a little bit. Maybe he's bracing himself because maybe he's about to be mocked by yet another person who's going to give him a hard time for even asking. But then Peter gives these immortal words, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, there's a spiritual axiom here, a, a mantra, a truth, and this is it. You can only give away what you truly have. You can only give away what's yours. I read a story about a man named Ian Barclay, right? And Ian loves art. He's a bit of an artist. He's always wanted to paint, but he can't paint. <laughs> he can do cartoons, and in fact, some of his cartoons, according, according to, I mean, they've been published in major newspapers, right? You can go Google it. Not now, later. But... You can look up some of his works. And he shared the story that on a recent trip to Italy, he found himself observing the masters, right? The da Vinci's, the Michelangelo's, all these masters. And he goes, oh, man, I want to be able to paint like that. And I'll tell you, what he does is good, but when you Google it, you'll be like, yeah, that's, that's, that's no Michelangelo. <laughs> that's, that's no da Vinci. He, he just doesn't have it. He, he can't produce that because it's just not in him, right? Bless his heart. There you go. See, now I can. Now we're like, oh, it's okay. Now, look, he doesn't have the spirit of Michelangelo. But, you know, he has the spirit of Christ. He's a Christian. He has the spirit of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And you know what? That's what Peter and John possessed, right? And so you know what? That's what they had. That's what they gave. What they had within them 
was the spirit, that other comforter, that other counselor, that helper, just like Jesus. And Paul said, Christ liveth in me. And Christ lived in Peter and John, and he lives in everyone who knows him as their savior. We are partakers of the divine nature. And as such, just like Peter and John, we can impart the power of Jesus' name because we are full of the Spirit of Christ. Look, we, ain't ha- we may not have any money to give. We may not. But we don't need money when we have the Holy Spirit. That's what we can impart. There's this um, old story that's told. Uh, how many of you have heard of Thomas Aquinas? Right? We didn't quite get to him in our study of, of uh, church history. Um, but Thomas Aquinas was involved um, with correcting some doctrinal error in the, uh, in the mid to early church, right? And he was approached by a pope. Now, I know some people mistook me for the pope last week. I apologize if there was any mistaken identity concerns. I will affirm I'm not actually the pope. <clears throat> Just to make sure, I thought I would address that publicly. But Pope Innocent, I love these names, by the way. Like Pope Innocent, not the first, but the second one. Okay, <laughs> Pope Innocent the second. I just, I just love it. <clears throat> I'm not even mocking it. This is so interesting to me. They're counting the money, right? They're counting the money, and the Pope is talking to Thomas Aquinas, and he says, "You see, Thomas, the Church no longer has to say, silver and gold have I none." Thomas Aquinas, as only he could, said, that's true. Neither can we now say, arise and walk. We love money. So, oh, no, brother, that's the root of all evil. Sure. Live by your budget. But I bet you in your budget, you're going to have plenty of space for all the goodies that you want. Now, look, this is not a, a message on giving. I'm saying we're comfortable. And money makes us comfortable. It just does. And we enjoy our comfort. And we want to invite people to an opulent church, a successful church, a church that has nice cars out in the parking lot. We want people to see all the cool stuff that we have. Oh, God has blessed my life. How do you know? Check out the boat. Check out the bike. Check out this. Check out that. Check out the backyard. Check out my plane tickets. Look at my next vacation. Oh, God has blessed me. And I'm not saying he hasn't. Don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But, you know, there's something about modesty. Now, hold on. I see that rabbit. I might catch it. Give me a second. We're conferring with one another. Okay. The intriguing thing about Paul's teaching to Timothy about modesty was about a modest lifestyle. You need a home? Great. Have a modest one that meets your needs. Need a car? Great. Have a modest one that meets your needs. You like to wear gold? He warned. Don't let the braiding of hair... I'm targeting my daughters. Don't let the braiding of hair, or even went so far to say the plaiting of hair, that is putting gold ornaments in your ears and your hair and a nice little necklace. If that's the extent of your Christianity, your Christianity is shallow. If people have to know you're a Christian because of, of a piece of jewelry, that's pretty shallow. If people have to know your Christianity because God blessed you with a, you know, a 23-foot boat, Great. Invite me out. Okay. I'm just saying. I was out on the water yesterday. Someone drove by in a boat and I said, Lisa, you know, I've realized I don't need a boat that big. (laughs) But I would like a friend with a boat that big. (laughs) So may God bless you. Okay. (laughs) But if, you know, that's all we're known by, we're not really known as disciples. Disciples impart what they have. The Spirit-filled church imparts what it has. So this is what we should be imparting, right? The Spirit-filled church imparts spiritual healing, right? Now let's read verse 7, because all this is text-driven, amen? And he took him by the right hand. This is Peter, 
doing Peter things. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, the, the miracle is both literal for this man and also parabolic. It's somewhat like a living parable because the spirit-filled church dispenses more than care for the body, more than care for the body. It brings healing to the soul. In the place of spiritual lameness, there can be spiritual leaping. The church that knows the power, the amazing power of Jesus' name, will preach the gospel without reservation. In fact, we would even go so far as we will in Acts chapter 4 to say that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved In fact, we would even sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Crown him. Crown him. The king of creation is the Lord of salvation. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one of whom Malachi even wrote saying, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And John the apostle would come by and say, oh, you want the son of righteousness? He's the light of the world. The light, that, the, the light spoke the light into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light, and it lit up the whole universe. But the light of Jesus Christ lights up everything beyond the scope of our understanding or science or comprehension. He's the light of the world. And oh, by the way, as Isaiah affirmed, by his stripes, we are healed. The son of righteousness has arisen. Messiah has come as the light of the world. And by his stripes, we are healed. Now, let me tell you, if you've been to Dr. Jesus for spiritual healing, you know that power. You know the power of his healing. Impart what you have received to other people. The spirit-filled church imparts spiritual healing through preaching salvation in the amazing name of Jesus Christ. We also impart joy, J-O-Y, joy. That's the opposite of grumpiness. But let's read the text. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now this rejoicing cripple entered into the temple and the echoing chambers resounded with his jubilation. Hallelujahs rang from the vast cedar ceiling of Solomon's porch. And everyone, it says there, everyone is going to stop. Even the money changers, right? And they're going to say, what in the world? Look, look at that guy. He's high jumping. But wasn't he, wasn't he the cripple? Now listen, this is what I want you to understand before we move a little too far. This man was joyful that he met Jesus. Let me tell you a story um, written by a gal named Irma Bombeck, right? She tells about how she was sitting in church one Sunday, and a small child turned around in their seat, right? And this small child isn't saying a word, isn't doing anything wrong, but just turns around and smiles, and Irma sees her and just smiles back, and they're just smiling at each other. And all of a sudden, here comes Mama, the wrath of the back of her hand. Turn around! I mean, it's like clutch your pearls, right? I mean, oh my, (laughs) what is going on? And she says, stop that grinning, we're in church. Mm. If I see anyone grin in the lobby today, you feel the wrath of the back of my hand, laddie, okay. Oh. She concluded, now these are her own words, all right, so that, don't get mad at me, you get mad at Irma, all right. She concluded that some people come to church looking like their deceased rich aunt left everything to the pet hamster. <laughs> I about died. I was like, oh man, that's great. Now what's the contrast? Spirit-filled believers, the spirit-filled church overflows with joy. Now, you've probably heard the phrase, fear not, or some variant of that in the text, be not afraid, don't be afraid, fear not. All right, that's in the Bible how many times? It's Facebook famous, right? This is your Facebook theology. 
365 times. So if you didn't know, now you know, right? So that means for every day of the year, don't be afraid. Don't, don't fear. You know what appears two times for every day in Scripture? Joy. Maybe we should be twice as joyful as we are fearful. And, you know, just so we have some scripture to back that up, has God given us the spirit of fear? No. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of joy and of a sound mind. Or, excuse me, power and of love and of sound mind. If he's given us that, that Holy Spirit, then a fruit of our life, a culture of our life, will be love and, oh, there it is, joy. Joy. And you know what joy is, scripturally speaking? It's not so much an emotion as it is a state of being which means you can choose to be joyful. What does that choice look like? Well, to be filled with the Spirit, you choose to prayerfully submit and ask for the Spirit's filling who will infuse our state of being with joy among the other eight fruit that he desires for us to experience. That submission and enjoyment enjoyment of his gracious presence is what overflows from the life of a believer and a spirit-filled church. Now, this place should be joyous. So let's make that contagious. Now, the last thing that the Holy Spirit imparts is wonder. I would say wonder and amazement. Let's read verses 9 and 10. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms by, or excuse me, at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement <clears throat> at that which had happened unto him. Now check it out. The temple regulars, right? The guys that have their seat marked out before they get there, right? Those guys. They could not believe what they were seeing and hearing. And, and look, this is what always happens. When there's joy and power in the church, people become curious about what happened and how it happened. Because if you know, then you know it doesn't just happen. When the Spirit-filled church is filled with the Spirit, when it has the power, when it has the joy of knowing Jesus, then that Spirit-filled church draws the world to itself, and most importantly, to its Savior. That's what matters. The text informs us that it was all the people, all these people. They had known the man in his previous condition, and they become witnesses of the miraculous authenticity that's taking place. And, and more than that, they, they were filled with wonder and amazement. They were there in awe in the presence of what was unmistakably divine activity. This could be nothing else than the the hand of God. And they took notice that they had encountered the power of God. When they got home from temple that day, they went, whew, can you believe what just happened? They didn't talk about anything else. Whenever they were breaking bread, they said, wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. Now, I want to point something out. It's a nuance. But amazement and wonder don't create faith. They're a byproduct of faith. What we need is God's word to be preached to make sense of what's being seen and experienced. God's word interprets the situations of our lives, and it calls for a decision. What are these people who are standing in awe and wonder in Solomon's porch, even the believers, what are they going to do? They have a decision to make based off of all this. Because the Spirit's proclamation of his power is going to lead them to make a decision. And that's where we stand here. A decision stands before all of us. Now, if you feel as though you're being drawn to the powerful name of Jesus Christ, then recognize his amazing power to spiritually heal you of your sins. If you've never experienced that before, come and trust him today. And if you are a disciple, choose to submit to the Lord. Choose to be filled with the Spirit and be the person that imparts what you have. You have joy. You have the, the spiritual healing and the wonder who God is and be used to draw others to Jesus Christ. The great concern of the first Christians 
was that the name of Jesus Christ would be glorified. And when you're filled with the Spirit, that not only will be your concern as well, but you will see that you impart to others what they need to experience under the name, the amazing name of Jesus Christ himself. So we all stand to our feet. The scriptures stand before us and they call for a decision. No matter who you are and where you're at, I, I pray that the Spirit has led you and that you will make a decision to be filled by him and to impart to this world what is most necessary. As the piano plays, please pray and ask the Lord to help you make this decision. Heavenly Father, we ask you, as you are always so faithful to do, fill us with your spirit. We submit ourselves and we ask you, Lord, to, to allow us to hear the sweet voice of the spirit and, Lord, to be used to impart to this world what is so vital for them. And, Lord, help us to be joyful and to rejoice and be jubilant, just like this lame man was. And, God, minister to our hearts and be glorified as we make decisions, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Just a few announcements here. The um, uh, baby shower for Lee and Courtney is coming up in just a few days. It's August 31st, and the address to the Schoenweiss's house is just out there on a little card on the table in the lobby. So if uh, you want to take a picture of that, um, that would be great, and you can be able to get over there. Now, that's August 31st. Um, is that... Yeah, 6 o'clock. Sorry about that. It's at 6 o'clock on the 31st, so mark that down and, um, and take a picture of that card as well. You'll notice one change if, uh, if you're tracking, and I hope that you are. I hope that, you know, some of these events aren't surprises to you. Um, but the church workday was previously scheduled um, on the 16th, and now it's going to be on the 23rd. Still a Saturday, just one week later. Um, I had a conflict come up um, uh, where I'll be out of town and so uh, I wanted to move that because I, I enjoy being here for the work day. And so hopefully you'll be able to join us. And uh, if not, if there's a conflict, plenty of work to do. Just come see me. We can do it anytime you're available. All right. Um, appreciate that. Uh, we also, also have some other events coming up, Fall Fishing Fellowship. So get your boat ready. I've, I need friends with boats. So this is your opportunity to fulfill a dream of mine in a sermon. So um, look for that. And then also be praying about, we have some special services coming up. The Lord of the Harvest service is coming up. It's in October, but it's the very first week. But pray about that meeting. Pray about our communities, our surrounding neighborhoods. Um, because that following Saturday, October 7th, uh, we will um, be going out into the community, as we did uh, about six months ago, to make a big push. Um, but also... Um, certainly most significantly, I want to remind everybody again, there's, there's a little card out there for who's your one. And you don't have to share that. You don't have to tell me. No one's going to ask for that. No one's going to follow up with it. But um, it's for you. It's a tool just for you to say, hey, this is my one. And if you still have one from earlier in the year and, uh, and you haven't paid much attention to it, again, you don't have to tell me, but dust it off and start praying for that person and see how the Lord uses you. Um, a few things. So, so things for you to pray about and, uh, and uh, consider. Uh, the church has various needs for helpers, workers, and teachers. So um, our nursery uh, would benefit from some workers. Um, Sunday school um, classes need teachers and helpers. And so does our junior church area. So um, if you're interested, and you may say, um, I've never taught in church a day in my life, but I'm willing to help out. I'm willing to try. One of the things I'm going to do in, in the coming weeks, I haven't scheduled it yet, um, but um, I will be teaching all of our volunteer teachers how to have the right techniques and procedures and how to manage a classroom and do all those things. And if, and if I could be so bold, um, I literally wrote a book on how to do that. And so um, I'm fairly confident 
in all humility in the Lord through the gifting of the Holy Spirit to be able to equip you to minister to the body of Christ. I hope that doesn't come off too boastful, but that is actually why one of the skills that the Lord led me to emphasize throughout my seminary studies. And so if you are like, I am completely clueless, I can clue you in. So it's also my, you know, pastor, teacher, it's kind of what I kind of what I do. It's in the job description. So please let me help you. And I know the Lord is burdening your heart to do that. You can be greatly used to minister to people who want to learn how to be disciples. And so nursery workers, Sunday school teachers, junior church teachers, and helpers for all of that. um, If you're interested, please come talk to me and we'll chat about it. And it'll be, it'll be great. And I think, let me check. I have like three things up here that tell me what to do and three people out there that tell me what to do. And one of them just snickered at the piano, but I'm not going to say who. Am I forgetting anything? My dear? Luke. Man, two out of three, man. I was so close. What's up? Okay. All right. If uh, you don't pick up your kids, we give them espresso and a puppy. So... (laughs) You know, roll the dice, see how it works out. Just saying, you've been warmed, all right? All right, well, with that, I think we need to pray. And I'm going to call on somebody, see who has an anxiety disorder. All right, Steve, would you come pray for us? (laughs) He was looking something up on Google that I mentioned during the sermon, I'm sure. Appreciate you, brother. No problem. Let's pray to be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for the great blessings we've received this morning from you. We thank you for new friends we've met. We thank you for letting us all get together in a safe environment where others around the world are not. We pray, Lord, that you can take care of us this week and bring us back next week and give us a wonderful testimony and let us pray more for our one and, and meet others and share Christ with them, Lord. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.